Welcome. Let me give a brief overview of logarithms. Unfortunately, there's a little quirky story in the history of mathematics that makes we, us use the word logarithm over a much simpler word, which would make this topic entirely so much less scary for students. Let me give you that history. In the 1400s and 1500s, scientific work was really going great guns. And uh, scientists were often collecting data, and they'd get, you know, they're measuring something like you know, the motion of a star, and they found its position is at some value of 3.159 degrees about the horizon one night, and that's 3.128 the next night, and 3.414 or something next night, and so on. So they'd often have these huge lists of data, and maybe they want to take the average to sort of uh, round out any errors they had, and uh, so that would involve these folks back in the 14 and 1500s, say, summing these numbers and they'd be doing it by hand. There was no calculators around. Now, that'd be a pain, but you could do it. It's not too bad to actually sum a list of numbers with, say, three decimal places or six decimal places or whatever. However, when you start doing formulas where you might want to multiply numbers as well, then things get mighty bogged down. Can you imagine what it'd be like, by hand, going 3.159 times 3.128, then times 3.1414 times times? That is a truly tedious and horrendous process. And this really bogged scientists down way back in the 1400s, 1500s, and so on, early 1600s. So then came along a fellow by the name of John Napier, who really wanted to help out his colleagues. He was born in uh, 1550, uh, that's the best estimates we have, to 1617 he died. He said, look, this is ridiculous. Why should science be hindered by the fact that long multiplication is so hard to do by hand? He wanted to devise a method that would actually turn multiplication problems into addition problems. Now addition isn't fun, but it's way simpler and way more accurate than multiplication, so it would be a big help indeed. So he set about to do that. Now he came up with a very strange approach, which we would think is somewhat unusual today. And suppose he was, sorry, let's give this a little detail, okay, suppose, was my pen, sorry, we want to work out A times B. He imagined a section of road with two vehicles moving on the road. Um, they weren't cars, but I'll just draw dots here, but whatever, he had two things moving on the road. He had one going at a constant speed, and another one going at a speed which in some strange way had its speed varying inversely proportional to the distance it had still had to go on this one unit length of road. Now, I'm being very complicated, I'm not explaining details here, and its speed was related to the two numbers in some clever way that he devised. And then he realized, if he was to work out the ratio of these velocities, that the math behind this crazy thing he was doing had the property of turning the multiplication problem, A times B, essentially into an addition problem. He called his wonderful new method, which he was very excited about, um, the ratio of numbers method. Now, he used the word logos for ratio from the Greek, and arithmos for number. So he called these things logarithms. And it was great. Now, he realized that his crazy method was not going to help scientists. They didn't understand it. So he wanted to come up with some practical way of doing it. So what he did for his colleagues is he wrote a table of values. He said, OK, here's the number n, and here's log of n. He said, let's say 1 turns out to be 0. 2 is matched with the number, I don't know, I'm making it up, 3.1. 3 is matched with the number 4.5, and so on. So he presented all his scientific colleagues some numbers a table of numbers like this. And he said, look, if you want to work out a multiplication problem, use my table as follows. Now I'm going to do a ridiculously easy one. Suppose you want to work out 2 times 3. Napier suggested, look at the number that goes with 2. It's 3.1. Look at the number that goes with 3. Because it's a table, it's 4.5. Can I read my own handwriting? And he said, instead of multiplying, let's add them. That's fine, 7.6. Go back to the table and see where 7.6 appears in the right-hand column. And if you do this, would see in this table, if I got my numbers actually were meaningful numbers, would match 6. So that tells me 2 times 3 is 6. So he presented these logarithmic tables for all his colleagues, and this was a marvelous revolution to free up all of scientific work in the early 1600s. It was brilliant. But the funny thing is, people didn't realize that logarithms were actually something very simple in disguise. But it wasn't until the 1700s that mathematicians cottoned on to what was really going on. But by then, the word logarithm had stuck. And here we are, 400 years later, still using the word logarithm, and it scares the dickens out of our students. Let me explain to you what logarithms really are. Now, I'm not belittling what Napier did. What he did was truly brilliant. It was just unnecessarily complicated. Here goes. 
The mathematics behind logarithms is actually straightforward. I'm just play a game. Suppose I asked you, uh, 2 to what power equals 8? Well, you'd say 3. Or if I asked you, uh, 5 to what power is 625? You would actually put in here 4. That's the game I'm playing. Or if I asked for half to what power gives me 4. I'm being a bit sneaky on you. It's actually negative 2. Or if I asked for what power of 7 gives the answer the square root of 7, you would say half. Maybe another way of writing these things is as follows. 2 to the 3 is 8. 3 is the power of 2 that gives the answer 8. And uh, 4 is the power of 5 that gives the answer 625. And negative 2 is the power of a half that gives the answer 4. And let's see, 1 half is the power of 7 that gives the answer, whoops, root 7. That's not hard. In fact, uh, let me go a little bit further with some more examples in this notation. Let me just uh, delete some stuff here. Sorry, a little fussy with my pen. Um, if I asked for what power of 10 gives a million, you would say 6. Or what power of 2 gives a quarter, you would say negative 2. Or what power of 0.1 gives 10, you'd say negative 1. Or what power of, I know, root 5 gives 25, you would say 4. Lots of fun just playing the power game. Very easy to understand, but here's the funny thing. These are logarithms. In textbooks today, we don't use the word power. We make kids write log of 2 that gives the answer 8 is 3. 4 is log base 5 of 625. Log base a half of 4 is negative 2. In fact, we just cross out the word power everywhere in our textbooks and write log instead and make this look very mysterious and scary. So if someone asked you, what's log base 3 of um, 81? I suggest don't use the word log, think power. I'm asking for what power of 3 gives the answer 81. If I think of the word power, it's clearly 4. That's what logarithms are. Now, maybe you didn't realize that. If you did, life would be easier. There are properties, and I need to ask, does, does thinking of logarithms as powers really address Napier's dream? That is, does it turn multiplications into additions? And I'm going to do a very easy answer. Um, I'm going to give another little lecture on logarithms that going deep into the mathematics, but the true uh, full story lies in chapter 13 of this particular book if you want to get all the nitty-gritty details of this. But for example, as a very simple answer, do we have Napier's dream? Does log base 2 of, say, 8 times 16 really equal log base 2 of 8 plus log base 2 of 16? That is, if I wanted to work out 8 times 16, can I really make this an addition problem instead? Now, I've chosen ridiculously simple examples here, but I just want to give an idea that it does the trick. I should prove this in a more general setting, and I will in another lecture and also in this book. Here goes. What power of 2 gives the answer 8 times 16? That's what the left-hand side is asking. Well, I need three 2s to get to 8. 2 times 2 times 2. And I certainly need four 2s to get to 16. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So it's clear I'm going to need three 2s to get to the 8. Then that gets multiplied by another set of four twos, so I'm going to need a total of seven twos to get to eight times sixteen. Well, three twos is all the twos I needed for eight, that's the three, and four twos is all the twos I needed to get to sixteen, that's log base two of sixteen, that's four. So yeah, it's kind of clear if you just sit here and think about it, with very nice numbers at least, that a multiplication problem has been turned into addition problem by logarithms. Okay, more anon in another lecture. Thanks very much.